Hello, my name is Dr. Robert Findlay. I'm the director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at University Hospital's Case Medical Center. I'm also a professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University. Now, in prior postings, I spoke about the challenges associated with accurately diagnosing schizophrenia in the adolescent patient. Now, in another prior posting, I also reviewed the components of a psychiatric history that could help facilitate making an accurate diagnosis of schizophrenia in a teenager. Now, today, I'll be talking a bit more about new therapeutic research that pertains to the pharmacological treatment of adolescent schizophrenia. Now, I should point out that the treatment of an adolescent who is, in fact, suffering from schizophrenia should not be limited to pharmacological intervention alone. A multimodal treatment plan is recommended so that the teenager suffering from schizophrenia might function as optimally as possible, both at home and at school. Now, until recently, uh, there's been a dearth of methodologically stringent research about the treatment, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological, of schizophrenia in teenagers. Now, uh, considering that there have been several new studies that have examined medication therapy and, unfortunately, there is still an absence of stringent research on other aspects of intervention. Uh, I've chosen to focus on medication therapy research in this patient population, at least for this blog. Now, until recently, there was only one medication uh, treatment study that was placebo-controlled that uh, actually evaluated the efficacy and safety of treatment of teenagers suffering from schizophrenia. Now, in that clinical trial, which was actually published in the 1970s, uh, the investigators reported that both haloperidol and loxapine were efficacious. Now, since that time, there have been several studies that have shown that clozapine may be actually the medication of choice for adolescents suffering from treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Now, in addition, there are now data from uh, placebo-controlled studies that have shown that the atypical antipsychotics risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, and aripiprazole are efficacious in this patient population. Now, I should point out that at present, placebo-controlled data pertaining to the efficacy of zeprazidone are not available. Overall, the new availability of placebo-controlled data in this patient population is really quite noteworthy. This was because so few studies in this patient population had previously existed. Now, when faced with a youngster who indeed suffers from schizophrenia, decisions about which medication to prescribe becomes a key issue. Now, as I mentioned before, if the patient is clearly treatment resistant, clozapine has the best evidence to support its use. However, the shortcomings of clozapine really pertain to its safety profile and the need for hematological monitoring. Now, for patients who are not treatment resistant, there are data from a recently published comparative study that can help clinicians and families make rational therapeutic decisions. Now, in the treatment of early onset schizophrenia spectrum study, otherwise known as TIAS, Dr. Lynn Sikich and colleagues, of which I am one, uh, performed a three-arm clinical trial in which youths received risperidone, olanzapine, or molendone in a blinded fashion. Uh, this study was published in the November issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry. Now, the authors found all three agents were associated with similar salutary effects. Now, this is a kind of during the first eight weeks of treatment, so it's a short-term study. However, the side effect profiles really did differ between the agents. For example, uh, youths treated with uh, molendone experienced greater rates of akathisia, despite the fact that they all received prophylactic molendone. Uh, those who received molendone received prophylactic benztropine under the auspices of this study. Youngsters treated with olanzapine, however, experienced the greatest amount of weight gain and had increases in cholesterol and other laboratory parameters one might expect in the face of substantial weight gain. Now, we authors highlighted the sobering fact that a substantive number of patients did not respond to these treatments and that each of these uh, medications were associated with a significant side effect burden, thus highlighting the need to identify safe and effective medication treatment options for these very, very vulnerable youngsters. 
So, in this blog, I have highlighted new treatment research in juvenile schizophrenia. Now, more research is certainly needed in this field. As far as medications are concerned, more long-term data, as well as comparative studies like TIAS, are needed so that clinicians can help families make informed treatment decisions when selecting pharmacotherapy for this chronic condition. In addition, more methodologically stringent work needs to be done regarding other forms of intervention in this patient population. Now, despite the gaps in the literature, the good news is that these recent medication treatment studies highlight the fact that scientifically sound research of methodological stringency can indeed be performed in this patient population. So in short, these treatment studies have substantially advanced what we know. However, they should only be considered a key first step towards providing the evidence-based care that these youngsters deserve. Please feel free to comment on what we've talked about today uh, by clicking on the Discuss link button that's located beneath this video screen. Uh, I'm Dr. Robert Findling, and uh, thank you for watching.